So good evening, everybody, and welcome to the uh, August 24th meeting of the Community Preservation Committee. Uh, we are joined tonight by lots of folks, I think, will be coming in um, with a chance to voice their opinions regarding uh, the one issue that we have, the main issue, which is the, the uh, Holy Street Project in St. John Cantius Church. Uh, historic preservation. So that's really what we're dealing with tonight. Before we do that, uh, we just have a few items relatively quick to go over. Uh, and then we will have public comment on the project. And then our funding recommendations deliberations will begin. Uh, as always, we start our meetings with any general public comments. Now, folks that are listening out there, this is comments that don't have to do with the project that we're discussing tonight. So if there's any folks who would like to discuss general community preservation committee or community preservation act issues, now is your time. If you could raise your hand, I'm hoping most people know how to do that on the bottom of your Zoom screen. Again, this is not a chance to speak to the issue at hand. This is a chance to just speak to general, uh, general issues. Uh, Claudia, I see your hand up. Uh, you need to unmute. Claudia, can you unmute yourself? Gotcha. Yes, there, yes, yeah. yes. Sorry. Um, I just have a quick comment about, about the CPC in general, and that it seems like the committee it, um, doesn't do that good of a job, or the city doesn't do that good of a job about talking about exactly what the use of these funds is for. So, you know, if someone has an issue. Uh, I was very inspired by Bridget Glacken's editorial, you know, guest column in the Gazette, talking about especially the recreation use. That there's so many uses, there's so many needs in the city for for um, open space and recreation. And I'm not sure how many applications you get from just citizens or from a neighborhood who might say, we have something in our neighborhood that really could use money. Maybe we should go to the CPC. So my comment has to do with maybe just thinking about how you might publicize uh, more broadly what it is you fund and how people might get involved in the process. I mean, maybe you do that already, but I haven't been aware of it myself. So that's my comment. Great, thank you, Claudia. And we do struggle with that, how to make ourselves better known um, because we tend to, to see the same applicants applying for stuff. Yeah. Um, certainly our website encourages that or small grants proposals encourage that we do our best to get the word out but um, clearly we could do a better job so thank you for that comment anybody else on terms of general comments regarding cpc stuff like claudia may okay so we have a, again a few items uh before we get to the issue of hand the first is approval of minutes we have two minutes that sarah sent us uh, January the 15th of 2021 and February the 2nd of 2022. So we need to vote to approve uh, both of those. Is there a motion to approve the minutes of uh, December the 15th, 21? Move to approve. Okay, thank you. There was, I think, Linda and was it Dan who also said it? Somebody else? Uh, any discussion about those minutes? Uh, Linda? On the December 15th under chair's report, the last line looks like sort of a sentence fragment. So I think maybe a few words were dropped, Sarah. Oh, sorry. Is the there... chair could have been very fragmented in terms <laughs> of sentences. It's so possible, but I doubt it. It's entirely possible. I'll, I'll uh, finish that sentence. Thanks, Linda. Okay. Any other comments on the December 15th minutes? Uh, all in favor of approval of those of those minutes, Sarah? Do you have to go through us one by one, or can we? We do. Uh, roll call vote okay. because we're meeting remotely. Uh, so quickly, Jen. Yes. Dan. Yes. Jeff. Yes. Chris. Yes. Martha. Yes. Linda. Yes. And Brian. Yes. All right. Thank you. Okay. So motion to approve the February second, two thousand twenty-two minutes. So moved. Thank you, Jeff. A second. 
Second. Uh, thank you, Dan. Uh, any discussion on these minutes? Okay, uh, all set for a vote, Sarah. All right, Jen? Abstain. Dan? Yes. Jeff? Yes. Chris? Yes. Martha? Yes. Linda? Yes. And Brian? Yes. All right, thank you. All right, thank you, Sarah. Uh, next in line is the chair's report. Uh, just a couple uh, items um, of interest to the committee. The first is, as I think most of us know, uh, Wayne Fiden has left after 35 years. Is that right, sir? 35 years uh, with the city, which is pretty remarkable. Um, and we have a new planning and sustainability director, and that is Carolyn Mish. I don't think Carolyn is joining us tonight. Is that is that correct? Uh, not tonight, no. Not she tonight. Will at, at an upcoming meeting. So we're quite sure uh, that we will see a lot of her, and we're hoping that she can come to our first meeting in September to introduce herself for those of us that that don't know her, and uh, that we can introduce ourselves to her because we do so much work. So uh, it was sad to see Wayne go, but it's uh, it's nice to have a new director and uh, she brings a lot of experience with the city and elsewhere as well. So welcome Carolyn Mish. The other thing that we're very sad about is that we're losing two of our members. Uh, Linda Morley is uh, not staying with us, that's terrible to say, is leaving at the end of this term, uh, having served here for, I wanna say eight years, 10 years. What has it been, Linda? Not that long. It only seems that long to you, Brian. Uh, well, then maybe seven years, but quite quite a long time. So, uh, Linda, uh, thank you so much for your tireless work, always doing wordsmithing and your expertise in housing and in your interest in everything else has been very much appreciated by this committee and by everybody else. So, Linda, thank you so much. Second person who has the audacity to move out of Northampton for some bizarre reason, it's hard to understand why, but Dan Krasner, where are you moving to, Dan? We're moving to Astoria, Queens, New York. Wow, that's quite a change. Most people moving from New York here, and you're- That's true. The, you are the opposite. Well, thank you so much um, for, again, for your work on our behalf and all of the enthusiasm and expertise that you brought to this committee, and we wish you the best in New York City. Uh, Linda will be replaced by uh, Beth uh, Bates, is that right, Sarah? Did I get her last name right? Uh, Bev Bates. Yes, uh, Beth, Beth, right? Uh, Bev with a V, B-E-V. -E oh, Bev, I'm sorry. So Bev Bates, um, who is uh, brings expertise as Linda did in terms of housing, and she will be joining us. I don't think she's here tonight, but she'll be joining us at our next meeting to, uh, as an appointee and and um, bringing that expertise in housing, which is really nice. With Dan leaving, it, it sort of leaves this hole because he's an elected rep. So the city council has the authority to appoint a person uh, while until Dan's term is up, which is uh, a year from November. So it's another 14 months, whatever that is. Uh, so we will wait for the city council appointment and hopefully Sarah that can happen soon so we can have a another member in yeah the city council has 30 days to make an appointment um council president is aware of it but I don't know where they are and, and okay great, great, good so once again thank you so much to Dan and to Linda for your work on this on this committee and for sticking with us with this last meeting um, which, sir, which uh, I'm sure will be an interesting one. Um, so that's that's the chair's report. Uh, financial overview, Sarah, you want to take us through the uh, projections, and that's all they are. So we don't know quite for sure. But Sarah sent out the over year for fiscal year twenty three, which began July first of this year. Uh, Sarah, can you give us just a synopsis of that? Uh, sure. So. Um... For everyone who's watching this financial 
overview for FY23 is available on the committee's website, along with um, a wealth of other information about the CPA. Uh, so our estimated local revenue is about one and a half million. Um, state match, we don't quite know yet uh, what it will be because the surplus funds uh, will be affected by, by this provision, some of this surplus needs to go back to the taxpayers, what we're estimating about 700,000. Um, our can... surplus state match from last year. Last open hour. But right now they're just giving the budget. Yeah. Uh, it just, uh, if everybody could mute themselves if, um, if they're not right. speaking. Uh, so, all right. Uh, debt service will be 238,000. So this is the remaining borrowing from uh, Pulaski uh, Park Overlook project, as well as the, the bean farm acquisition. Um, so all in total, we'll have about 2.4 million uh, to allocate to projects. Uh, some of that is within the, the three set-aside accounts of affordable housing, open space, and the historic reserve. Sarah shared with me that uh, while a, a lot of uh, applicants have submitted their cover letters, none of them have budgets attached. So we really don't know what we're going, what we're, what the expectations are in the fall. Other than we have a lot of interested parties, but we really don't know what those, uh, what those parties are asking for. And applications are due um, mid September, so we'll we'll know at that point what uh, what the projects are and, and what's being requested. Are there questions from the committee to Sarah regarding the financial overview? Everybody good with that? Uh, it looks okay. like Elaine, did you have a question? Hi, I'm Elaine Jundu, and I don't have a question about the financials, but uh, people are telling me that they can't get on for the meeting this evening. So I just wanted to let you know. Uh, I, there's no one, there's a lot of people in the meeting and there's, there's no one that I see in the waiting room at the moment. Is there Mark Mojo in the waiting room? Uh, Mark is, has joined. Okay, fine. Thank you. Thanks. So any questions to Sarah regarding the uh, financial overview that folks have? Just one thing that I'd like to add to what Sarah said is I think uh, most of us know that uh, Michelson uh, Galleries has turned down the uh, the offer. So that money has uh, that has been uh, returned to our project funds. Um, so uh, that is that is not not happening. That project is not being funded. Um, so I think we're we are good to go. Okay, so we are excited to be joined by a lot of people listening in tonight. So thank you everybody who who is here and interested. Um, we've generated as much, if not more, interest in this Holy Street of the St. John Cantius project than, than of any other project since I've been on the committee. And we've had, uh, um, we, we opened up to a public comment earlier in the year when we were first considering this proposal. We had lots of people uh, speak um, on behalf of the project. Almost everyone who spoke at that public hearing spoke in favor of the project. Uh, in, in the meantime, uh, in that we deferred action on this until the summer, we've got an opportunity to get lots of letters uh, coming in. Uh, I did a rough count and, and, I, and I think I'm pretty close to being right, but we had, according to my count, uh, 61 letters uh, come in to Sarah's office, 48 were in favor and 13 were opposed. Um, we've had letters to the editor. We had a long column uh, critical of the project in yesterday, was it? Or the day before paper? Yesterday. Yesterday's uh, um, uh, Northampton, Hampshire Gazette. Uh, so there's, a, there's, there's certainly a lot, of, a lot of interest in this. So I want to make sure that folks know who are not on the committee that number one, we've had an opportunity to read the proposal, discuss it, uh, defer it until this summer meeting because we had not heard from the Historic Commission and 
Um, we felt like we needed some more information. Uh, we opened it up for a public comment and we heard folks speak. Uh, we have read the letters that folks have uh, submitted and lots of lots of really, really good comments there. For with maybe one exception, I think, everyone uh, likes the idea of historic preservation for the church. Um, not, uh, uh, there are quite a few people, the 13 letters, in, in, in fact, that were in opposition that are very much opposed to public financing for the historic preservation. So this is not an issue of um, do we uh, value the historic preservation or not? Just about everybody, if not everyone, values the historic preservation. The issue at hand is should public monies, in this case, 500,000, which is what um, the applicant has asked, be used uh, to, uh, uh, for historic preservation and to get a historic preservation restriction on the building. Um, so again, this is not, oh, we don't like historic preservation. It seems to me from my reading that uh, everyone is in favor of historic preservation, but not everyone is in favor of public monies to go toward historic preservation when it is a private entity that is doing that, that is looking at market rate housing uh, for, for the, the old church and that the public will not be allowed into that building. So that seems to be the, the, the issue the issue at hand. Um, even so, what I would like to do is to have people speak who are here who who want to speak, um, knowing that this is your this is your chance for input. When the committee begins deliberations, we will ask that you listen. We encourage you to stay and to listen in. But those deliberations are made by committee members rather than involving uh, everyone who who is out there. And that's not. Uh, um, being condescending or dissing those of you who are hearing things that you may not agree with, but this is the way that the committee works. And again, I think we uh, and continue to have ample opportunity for public discourse and for, for public comments. So if that makes sense, we will be begin with public comments and then we will move on to our deliberations as a committee. So again, if you can raise your, do your little hand raising on the uh, on the bottom left, is that what it is of your screen? Uh, that that would be great uh, for folks who want to speak now. I'm assuming there are people. Uh, Linda, you want to start it off? Yeah. No, I don't want to make <laughs> a comment at this point. A request, um, given the number of speakers, and um, this is an important issue to a number of people. So I'd like. I wonder if you might set a time limit on individual comments. So everybody has a chance to speak. And so we still have our wits about us when it's time for us to make a, a decision. Great, thank you. Thank you, that's a good comment, Linda. Generally, we try to keep people to about three minutes or under so if people can be respectful of that. And again, as Linda mentioned, being respectful of the fact that other people might, might, want, to, might, might want to speak. Uh, so, any other uh, comments from committee members before we open it up to general public comment? Uh, okay, uh, looks like uh, Jackie Balance, you have your hand up, Jackie. Yes, thank you. Um, I think that a half a million dollars is a lot of money to give somebody who's going to make a big profit on transforming one of our treasured um, architectural. Um, features of Northampton, is it possible if they really need that money to make it a loan and let him pay the city back out, out of the tremendous profits he's going to make? That's just a thought that crossed my mind. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Sarah, have we ever, Sarah Valley, have we ever done a loan situation? That is not in our purview, is that correct? Uh, not for a building improvement project or historic rehabilitation. The only uh, loan structured projects that we've done are uh, affordable housing. And, and not a lot of those as well. Thank you. And thank you for that comment. Uh, Jane? 
Yes, I, um, first of all, thank you very much, all of you on the committee for what you do. Um, Brian, I just wondered, first of all, is, is, is tonight's meeting the ultimate decision on this, just so everybody knows, or does this come before the city council for ultimate approval? Uh, thank you, Jane, for raising that. I neglected to mention what the process is for those that don't know. Um, the Community Preservation Committee is a recommending body. So mm -hmm. this is the night that uh, unless some unforeseen thing happened, that we will make a recommendation for okay. or against the project. The city council is the one ultimately that has the approval to do that. Um, okay. in, the, in the past, Jane, they have been uh, receptive to what we have said. And I can think of maybe one incident where, where the mayor had some objections, um, uh, but they, are, they hold the purse strings and they're the ones that, that ultimately make that decision. Okay, thank you for that clarification. I would just like to mention, um, I think it's an important thing to consider here to clarify the difference between historic preservation and um, the giving of monies to a private developer. So as you said, I think probably everybody can um, respect the fact that the history of the church wants to be celebrated and, in some way, but I think it sets a terrible precedent to give this amount of money to a private developer who um, has already built a number of units, only one of which has sold and all of which are over $700,000. Presumably what he will do if given this money, which I hope he's not given, is to build more at the same prices. And I think that um, it sets a terrible precedent for use of this precious money. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Uh, Claudia? Thanks again. Um, I don't know if it's possible, Brian, but for you to tell us how many letters came in after uh, the request for the CPC, CPA money uh, was announced. Do you know, because I think the overwhelming majority, I mean, you're saying 48 were in favor of the project and 13 were against, but it seems like some people wrote, obviously, there was a campaign to save the church. I mean, someone donated $50,000. And That's so right. they made this, so they made a, a committee or whatever. Sorry, um, am I, are you hearing me? Yes, so, we are. So, so a committee was established, you know, to help preserve the church. And, and in the process, I'm, I'm sure lots of people wrote letters saying we want to save the church. The question I have is how many letters came in of those letters, you know, were just came in before the question of the private of the public funding for the project happened, because I think it's really important to, to say that there some people might have liked the project. I would say I was in favor of preserving the church at the beginning, and if if, if uh, O'Connell could save it, that would be great. But I'm not in favor of using tax money to do it. So, is it possible for you to sort out what? Because you're giving us the impression that the majority of letters you came, you've got, are supporting the money. Is that true? Or maybe not, maybe I'm misreading. Just I'm asking for some clarification. Uh, Claudia, I can try to speak to that. You know, it's it's not possible to know the background behind every letter, uh, but as far as the timing goes, every letter that it was received and was placed in that folder was uh, after O'Connell's application was made. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Claudia. Uh, Bridget? Uh, Bridget, you need to uh, unmute yourself. Nope, still muted. Okay, sorry. There we go. Uh, so um, I've been following this um, for about a year. Uh, the CPC, I've been to, I've in the past come to live uh, CPA meetings because and this is really unrelated. It's, it's, I mean, other than I've been to the live meetings because I was a member of the board of the Broadbrook Coalition for about five years, a while back. So I'm familiar with the process, but more recently I've been following this since the fall, I would say. I've been to these meetings or seen the tapes and the historic commission meetings. I can do all that because I'm retired. You know, it's, I find it with, you're doing minutes now with, with respect from last January. So for the public, 
to follow this. There have been a number of twists and turns and changes in the application. I'm not saying that those are uh, unsavory, but that is so. And so these letters, I've read the letters that, you, that a person can see on your website, the public comment letters for this project. And they, date, they do date back over at least nine months. There's a number of people who say, I'm in favor and I want a, a beautiful entertainment center there or an art center there. And that's not going to happen with any of this that's gonna be voted on tonight. I think that is so. And my issue, I've also somebody who's in, in support said, well, some folks have a philosophical problem that the applicant is private. And I don't have a philosophical problem. I have a problem that with respect, and I respect everyone here who's worked so hard on this committee for so long, I don't think that you can evaluate a nonprofit or a municipal applicant in the same way that you can evaluate a for-profit. That is so, because we heard it with the Michelson application that he, the applicant would say, I, in a variety of ways, and again, with respect, I don't need to tell you the financials of the gallery, how much I paid when I bought it how much I've spent to do my own maintenance, whether this is neglected maintenance. And he said, the reason I don't do that is because I have 45 beloved artist clients in the future that would relieve, reveal their financials. Of course, we don't want that. That is standard, that he, this is a private entity. A, a nonprofit sold the church. That was the church. There was a lot of objection about that by the parishioners in 2010, but again, this is also considered to be proprietary information. If I give you this information, that affects my competitors. This is completely different than municipal government finances and nonprofit finances where by statute, IRS documents, public documents, all of that is transparent. So we can talk about what the profits might be or what else is gonna happen, but we don't know. And so I just don't feel that a judgment can be made. I thought the Michelson project was problematic. I thought the nursing home project, a wonderful mission was problematic because it's only guaranteed to have that use for five years. And we, this, a private person, a wonderful person I'm sure owns it. So it's not a philosophical problem. I think it's, a, it's an operational problem for the committee. I think it's a bad precedent as someone has said, and I think it's a template for how to approach for, um, for profit applicants in the future. I think there's been a vacuum. God bless Wayne Feiden. May he have a wonderful second life. You know, the, we have a, had a hiring process, planning department getting up to speed, you know? So I just think that, and I understand about the Solomon's wife and splitting the baby one third for housing, one third for historic and one third for, open space and recreation, you know, but I, I, and you can show that that's what this committee has done over many years, but I don't, I think that the committee in my view has to be more, there's nothing in the statute that says you have to be completely reactive, that you can't be proactive, that you can't raise your profile in the community, let people understand. And it's, I'm a retired person. I can sit around and watch videos. These minutes are way behind. The news, I'm not anti the newspaper, I feel, but I've talked to them about some other things I'm working on lately. And I don't find, I find them very competent, but they don't have any excess time or staff to inform us about a lot of things. So I, I just think that this is a bad precedent and this is a, an incorrect template. And it, God help me, I'm gonna say slippery slope. That's my view. Honest brokers and good citizens, intelligent people will disagree, but this is what I think. Thank you, Bridget. Uh, Janet? Uh, Janet Gross, are you are muted if you're trying to speak? Uh, see your hand up? Yes, can you okay. hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. I have looked at the um, CPC website and read the guidelines. And one thing that I have failed to see is any public purpose for this 
money. Apparently, it is critical that there be a public purpose. And in fact, the lack of a public purpose is a violation of state law. I hope someone will look into this. Um, yes, I am very concerned that public money is going to this project. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. Uh, Marvin? Yes, thank you. I would like to second Janet's comment. I've had a lot of time in my life working with nonprofits. I've actually created one, a 501c3 one. It's not a difficult thing to do. Um, I would feel that the OGG should do that, create a 501c3. It can even make its own donations to it tax deductible. It has to have a public use to get public money. Uh, I, it's, you need to have to get a, the 501c3. You have to have a, a filing of a bylaws and a board and board members with the Secretary of State in Massachusetts and of course with IRS. All of the information about how to do it is available online. I did it a number of years ago in 2006. That particular failed, 501c3 failed for lack of money. It's not a difficult thing. I have a paralegal certificate. I'm not a lawyer, but I know how to do it because I have worked and I still write for a nonprofit website concerning classical music. I get a, a review every month and I've been doing it for over 20 years. And I help get that off the ground in North Carolina when I live there. So I am not opposed to giving some money to help, but it has to have a nonprofit basis that serves the public. And that is something that the AODG can do. It's not a difficult thing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Marvin. You're welcome. Uh, other folks wishing to speak? Not, oh, here we go. Uh, is it uh, Tris? Is that right? Uh, unmute yourself, please. Is that, this is Joanne. I'm unmuted now, right? Yes. Oh, sure. true. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Yeah. So. Um, seems like most of the comments are talking about public use. Um, I submitted my letter with a drawing, been working on this project to save the church for over a year. And there's a very, I think, ideal solution to give the money to ODG to develop six units at grade level below the church, keep the church open for public use, to be a nonprofit and it'll be a win for everyone. And if the church is saved inside and out, then it could also get very easily could get historic preservation tax credits. This would be on top of the profit of six condominiums, 1200 square feet each, which would be basically below the floor of the church. The ramp down would be shorter than the ramp up and it would be a, a solution that would, again, serve everyone, provide housing, um, provide profit, and provide a public space on a street across from the Center for the Arts. It'd be a, a wonderful venue for all kinds of gatherings. There's an excellent uh, organ, one of the top instruments that exists in that building, painted ceilings. Basically, the money would be used to preserve what's there and the cost to build below that floor is, is actually would be less cost than building up above, except for the only question is when you go through the foundation for connecting the inside to the exterior, exterior by the way would have a roof, which would be a lawn. So in, in essence, the only difference you'd see would be the lawn would come up two feet on the Phillips Street side of the building. And, um, it would be, again, six condominiums for profit, 
tax credits and a public space for the city. Uh, the drawings are on the site if anybody wants to see them. That's all I have to say. Thank you so much for your comments. Uh, Claudia, who is not Claudia? Yes, thank you. Uh, I'm Mac Everett, I'm Claudia's husband and sharing her computer. And uh, I have lived in the neighborhood where the church is for a long time. I've always appreciated its presence and its historical value to the, especially to the community that migrated here in the 19th century and then built that church with probably a lot of nickels and dimes put together. But at the same time, as other people have voiced, I am deeply concerned about the idea of using CPA money to essentially subsidize private development. Um, I mean, what, what happens when another developer comes to town and sees a building that we might consider to be a historic building and then says, well, I've bought it and now <clears throat> I'll preserve it if you pony up the money, otherwise I'm gonna demolish it. Uh, that's, that's a nightmare scenario that, that could be repeated if this precedent is uh, allowed to happen. Um, I'd feel really differently if it wasn't market rate housing. If it was affordable housing in there, great. That would be a wonderful thing. And <clears throat> I'm deeply disappointed. I think some folks, perhaps including Tris, have submitted other plans that we saw at some point for uh, smaller condos that would be um, much more affordable in there, but I gather that that was uh, rejected. So anyway, I have to throw my hat in with the folks that are saying, let's try to preserve it, but we need other kinds of funding to do it. Uh, if we can't, we sh should not put public money into it. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Uh, other folks? Bunch of folks who have not spoken. Here we go. Uh, Elaine. Hello. Hello. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, Ernie Levinson is going to speak. Be speaking. We're here together. Hi, my name is Ernie Levinson. I live on Hancock Street and have lived there um, for twenty-seven years, and. The church has been a, a part of my life. And I'd like to make just a couple of comments. Uh, what does CPA mean? Community preservation is a powerful concept. In Judaism, it is the synagogue. For Muslims, it is their mosque. And for the Northampton Polish immigrant community, it was St. John Cantius. It was built in 1912. Why did they build it? because it enabled them to have a place to be a part of, where they could gather, where they as a group could have an identity. In the early 1900s, this immigrant community was in the forefront of the diversity that Northampton is so proud of today. St. John Cantius was a symbol for them, much like the Statue of Liberty, to welcome them from their journey. From, from their journey. It was and is more than bricks and mortar, but a beacon for those looking for a better life and for those who had to leave their home because of persecution and World War I and World War II. Today, it stands as a memorial for those who lost their lives during those dark days. Ladies and gentlemen, I ask you to think about the history of our town and what a structure St. John Cantius means to those who were and our members of our community when they were not welcome elsewhere. Thank you. Thank you. Elaine, are you commenting as well? Yes, I am. Yeah. I believe that the CPA's program mission is to support historic preservation. So if that's what the CPA mission is, then why wouldn't CPC recommend having, giving, granting the 500,000. I understand they're a public entity, but if they take down this gorgeous church, you're taking part of Northampton away. 
And that might happen if they don't get the funding. I'm not quite sure, but I really support that CPC grants the funding for St. John Cantius. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Elaine. Uh, other folks wishing to comment at this time? So we have a few folks out there. Uh, George? Good evening, everyone. My name is George Kohout. I live down on State Street. <clears throat> um, so yes, I'm here also to voice my concern uh, regarding approving O'Connell o Development Group's application for a half a million dollars towards the uh, extensive renovation and repairs of the St. John's Cantius Church. Um, I, I appreciate the way the chair framed it as mostly all of us value the historic preservation of buildings in our city of Northampton. Um, this is certainly an iconic church, an iconic bell tower that many of us can see from different parts of the city. And if we lost it, we would surely miss it. Um, and it's a historic touchstone for many of the immigrants of that area and the people who grew up in that part of Ward 3, um, especially those who for generations have attended services there. I, I get that. Um, I understand that, um, but I think the, uh, all of these benefits, all of these positive notes are outweighed, um, in my opinion, by the precedent the CPC would set um, if they approve the application um, to a private uh, developer whose sole purpose is the reuse of the building for high-end condos. Um, I had the, the great opportunity to work with a committed bunch of folks back in 2005 to get the legislation for the CPC, CPA passed here in Northampton. One of the biggest foundational arguments we used when talking to the voters was that all of the projects would be accessible to the public. All of our public tax dollars that go into it um, would be used for the public good really. So there's certainly a public virtue in saving the historical aspects of the building, um, but I think it pales in consideration of some of the, in comparison to many of the other projects, almost all of the other projects funded by the CPC in the past 17 years. The Florence Field, the affordable housing, the conservation land, um, I could go on and on, and all of those um, provide benefits to the citizens of Northampton. Um, you know, and, and while I was on the CPC, I remember many applications that came before us from people who owned great historic homes in our residential neighborhoods, who wanted to do some repairs and fix them up um, so they could retain that historical aspect of their homes. But we, we just couldn't go that way, no matter how much we wanted to, because they, that was really their personal property, their private property, and they weren't open to the public. Um, I believe if we move in favor of this application with O'Connell, that will be setting a precedent um, and allowing many more developers to come through us, come through the CPA with similar applications. Um, the, the CPC committee, bless you all of you for spending your long days here. And Linda, thank you for all of your seven years of duty. Um, you've got a tough decision ahead of you. Um, I certainly hope you aren't swayed by the sheer numbers of the proponents of the application. Um, unfortunately, it's, it's just not a numbers game. Uh, tough decisions have to be made. And as I've heard from previous speakers, you know, I, I really hope there's another way to memorialize the church if in fact um, the developer who owns the church moves in a different direction, much as the state hospital has been memorialized with a fountain of course, it pales in the uh, relation to the wonderful buildings, the mass of the buildings was at the state hospital, but it's still a memorial for people, a touchstone for people who have a connection to the state hospital that was. Um, so thank you very much for the time today. Uh, good luck with your deliberations. Appreciate all the work you do. And I really appreciate all the work that the citizens group has done um, and Chris and others to put into creatively thinking about how to reuse the building 
Um, and unfortunately, in our market economy, it just doesn't always work um, for, for us to have everything that we want. So appreciate the time. Thank you very much. Thank you, George. Fred? Uh, what, where, what I'm trying, to, yes, I'm here. I'm just trying to unmute myself. Uh, my name is Fred Zimnock. I live in, uh, um, Pomeroy Terrace Historic District, on um, Pomeroy Terrace. And I, I think there's some points that have to be clarified here. I can understand that, uh, people would object to, uh, providing money, um, to, uh, you know, a private party to, to uh, save the church. However, there's something a little bit different in this case. First of all, I think you want to remember that the church is not only uh, historic, but it's a historic landmark, landmark, not simply historic, but a historic landmark. The second thing is that this procedure is a little bit different. Uh, in order to get forward on this, uh, the historic commission uh, had to judge what was going on uh, with the developer and also with the building. So that was another level of approval. This other thing that's different is that he, this also, in order to be preserved, has to go to Mass Historic Commission. So that's another level of uh, investigation that has to be done before this is final. So it's not simply a matter of putting money to a public, uh, a private uh, individual. The second thing about public services, yeah, it's true. You won't be able to go in the building, but you will save the building and it will become and continue to be part of the historic landmark of the city. And I think that's something we all value and I'm in support of this proposal uh, to uh, save the church. Thank you. Thank you, Fred. Hi, I don't know if I'm doing this right. Uh, is this Joanne speaking? Yes, it is. Okay, Joanne, that's all right. You're, we can hear you, so go, okay. go right on. I didn't know how to go. Uh, anyway, I just have a quick question. <clears throat> Am I to believe that if um, there was a way for the public to access the inside of the building, these funds would be more apt to be approved given the stipulations regarding the use of the CPA? of the CPC funds? Uh, Joanne, in the, in the uh, in, in, I, I, I would defer to the developer on that. These will be private uh, units, uh, con condominiums, uh, okay. apartments, whatever the use is. So people will not be allowed to come into a, uh, to private dwellings. Uh, so the answer to that will be no. Okay, and, and if, if there was some way that the committee could further their efforts into raising funds for something to access the building without um, impacting the individuals that would buy the condominiums, would that um, and and the and the develop the developers would say, okay, we'll agree with that. Would that be a way to um, release the CPC funds to the um, to O'Connell's? Uh, at, at this point, what we're doing as a committee is reacting to the proposal and okay. doing doing our, our best with that. Um, I don't know if this is appropriate, but I'll I'll, I'll uh, make a case for it anyway. Um, we're joined with Matthew uh, Wel Welter, right, Matthew? Um, Matthew is the representative who's um, uh, been voice, been uh, the, the face of Okano and, and uh, advocating for the, for the proposal. So Matthew, maybe you wanna, we'll give you an opportunity to speak here. I think that that's, that's appropriate. Sure, thanks. Thanks, Brian. Thanks to the rest of the committee and, and to the public. Um, uh, just as a kind of, Refresher point of introduction, Matt Welter, uh, Vice President of Development for O'Connell Development Group. And we are, I'm working on behalf of the, uh, the developer applicant. Um, just to, to kind of clarify the scope, um, 
our, our intentions for the project. It will be 10 units for rent. Um, it will not be an ownership or condominium uh, structure. Um, and I think as Brian, you mentioned, um, we've done a lot of studying and um, feasibility studies to determine a minimum threshold of, of density and the 10 units and our ask for $500,000 is our is essentially kind of our, our breaking point where we do need to have that level of minimum units and then that level of, of funding in order to to allow this to be financially viable. Um, I know it's, uh, you know, I fully respect and understand people's concern that that seems like a significant amount of money, especially from a private developer. Um, you know, I would say that, you know, one of the, the differences that um, our project as a, as a private developer, and I think uh, Fred mentioned this as well, is with the, the preservation restriction agreement is there, there'll be um, levels of teeth that the city has that will require us uh, to continue maintenance repairs for in perpetuity. Um, and in a lot of ways, I think um, a private developer or you know a for-profit developer is probably in the best position to take on that financial responsibility that will be significant. Um, we have every intention to uh, follow the Secretary of Interior um, historical standards that again, will be in place with the preservation restriction um, agreement. And, um, you know, I think one of the other kind of key differences that, you know, I think this, this it, you know, compared to some of the other examples is um, this will be a tax rateable to the city. So if we were to even conservatively, um, you know, can't crystal ball what the assessment would be on the building, but um, assuming even and I hate doing this because it's on, on record, but uh, even a $25,000 property tax annual bill would, would have a payback of 20 years. Um, and that assumes kind of flatline property taxes for that 20, 20 year period, which I think um, <laughs> realistically, um, you'll see property taxes increase over that 20 year period. So, um, you know, I think there's a mechanism, you know, a couple mechanisms that are that are in place that will allow a payback period, um, and then also uh, continuing maintenance and repair obligations that will be put in place that will really hold us hold our feet to the fire. Um, that will allow the city to inspect and make sure that we're we're maintaining the building to its kind of prior glory. Thank you, Matthew, uh, Bridget, and Jane. You. Both of you have had uh, a chance to speak already, so let's make sure other people don't. And then uh, if you could hold your comments to very, very short ones, we'd appreciate that. Other folks who have not had a chance to speak yet, now is your chance. Uh, Mark? Sorry about that. I gave a thumbs up instead of a, a raised hand. I'm not sure how to use this sometimes. Um, can you, everybody hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you, Mark. I, I just wanted to mention that I think uh, what Matt was just talking about is if, if there is that 25,000 per se uh, that he is paying or they are paying, uh, part of that money is CPA money that they're contributing to the city as well. And I understand how people uh, see, you know, a problem with some of this private uh, company getting public funds and stuff. And I can agree with that to some degree, but I also do want to see this church uh, saved. And, and it's sad that uh, we're in this predicament that um, it seems as though it's like, well, geez, if we don't give this $500,000, then the church is going to come down. And that's not necessarily a given, but it's like, it's almost like being held hostage here to some degree. Um, and I just, I feel very uneasy with that feeling that, um, that a lot of the buildings in our town, historic buildings that we'll never get back and uh, are just, this could happen to any building around town. Uh, and I'm thinking about, uh, and I don't want to just um, target churches, but I think about St. Mary's, the same thing. 
It's a big stately building on a corner that's been there forever. Uh, who knows that could happen next, uh, that the situation come, could come along. Um, but that's pretty much it, just some thoughts. Thanks. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Deborah, I don't think we've heard from you, right? Right. Okay. So. Uh, you haven't heard from me tonight. You have actually heard from me quite a bit <laughs> over the last two years and three months, four months. Um, I've been working on with a bunch of people involved with this community on trying to preserve this historic landmark. And I want to just echo and emphasize what Fred said. This is not just an historic building. If you look at the ordinances and the, and the definitions, a historic building is older than 1945, but a historic landmark building is quite unique. It has to be special. We could look at the language, but basically, we don't have a lot of buildings that are historic landmark buildings waiting in line for CPA money. So I think a lot of the fear mongering of the slippery slope is not well founded. Uh, we have, um, as you know, we did have a generous donor that made it possible for us to hire an expert who assembled a team of historic preservationists. An architect, an engineer, mason, you know, contractors. And we developed various plans. But what the, the our expert, our head guy, Bill Krauss, and he has written into this committee talking about this as well, what he came up with was the same thing that Matt Welter and, and ODG came up with. This is an unusual project to develop. And you know, this isn't my area, but I certainly learned a lot over the last two and a half years. This is a small development. If it were a St. Mary's where you could put in perhaps, and I don't have looked at the St. Mary's footprint, but if you could put in 20 units, maybe a developer wouldn't need CPA funding to help weather tighten. Um, we have the diocese to thank for the fact that there was no maintenance done since 2010. Yes, ODG knew that when they bought it. I can't say that you know they all of a sudden discovered it, but they did know, okay, there's going to be some serious weatherproofing to do before we can do anything. We have to weatherproof and preserve the exterior. I was skeptical, as many of you are, with, you know, because we've been trying and trying to get some plans that would have public interior access developed. The problem is, again, you go back to St. John Cantus, and I don't know how many of you have been inside the church building. Many of the, by the way, many of the writers, the letter writers, and I went through and, and looked at all of the letters today, six of the people that wrote, to my count, have lived in this neighborhood. They're either on Butler Place, on Phillips Place, or on Holly Street, and they've lived there for decades. And they are in favor of keeping this building standing. It is, a, and, and the, the reasons people give are ethnic, the Polish community, the ethnic value, the aesthetic value, and the historic value. So are we in a bit of a mucky position? Yes. I don't think any of us would like to see, you know, this situation, but what is the alternative, I ask? For those people, and, and I was interested in listening to people, you know, go on and about express their views, which are perfectly fine, and I understand those views about their concern, this and that. The problem is we don't have another St. John Cantius Church in Northampton. We don't have Many, I mean, we could ask Martha Lyon, maybe, maybe the Historic Commission knows this offhand. I don't. I don't know how many in the downtown map that's been redone, how many historic landmark buildings we have. Some of the, if we do have some, I'm sure we have some, they're probably somewhat private owned. I don't know if perchance there will be another situation like this, but from my learning from the work that we've done over the past couple of years, 
with Bill Krause and his team, this is a very difficult project to develop, especially if you try to keep the historic integrity, which is what the team that Bill hired was, uh, was all about. And he's consulted, they've consulted with Matt. Matt's been very receptive to their expertise. Um, I was at the Historic Commission meeting. They required as a condition of their support that Matt utilize the recommendations of their historic preservation expert, Mr. Thaler, I guess is how you call it, from Albany, that they were ordered by this group, I believe, to furnish this historic structure report to Martha Lyon, and the whole committee, the historic committee, um, to, to show what recommendations to keep it historic as much as possible. And I feel like Matt has indicated quite a willingness to do this. If he hadn't, and it was just going to be a, you know, redo the building, make it look, you know, like nothing else, then I don't know that I'd be in support of it. But I feel like there is a good faith agreement to follow the recommendations of the expert, the preservationist expert, Thaler, who's had decades of experience in this. And he hired him, he reported, and now he is saying, I will follow that. I will work with the Mass Historic and the Department of the Interior, Secretary of the Interior, whatever. I feel like That's, we have a, a really good plan for this building, which is a difficult building. And I would certainly like to see this building stand. So I think CPA money, and by the way, the CPA, the act provides for historic preservation. That's what this is. Great. So, thank you. That's all, that's thank all you. I Thank you so much, Deborah. Uh -huh. Thank you so much. Yes. Uh, other folks who have not had a chance to speak? Anybody else? Okay, uh, Bridget, again, if we could make it very quick, if there's just one fo quick yes. follow-up comment. Uh, you're, you are muted. Oh my goodness. I don't think I am muted. You can't hear me uh, now? Now, we, we can now, yes. Okay. So first is, I didn't speak to the affordable housing, but I have a question to the committee. What do you do when part one set of goals for the CPA effort is in conflict with, an, with another project? And I didn't give the information. It is a fact. UMass Donahue study phase two of housing needs in the Pioneer Valley that since very different than 2010, beginning about 2015, worsening in 2018. And we all know it, there was a housing crisis in the city of Northampton in terms of not just we don't have enough housing in our community for our low income people, which is pretty obvious, but we don't have enough housing for, as I hear, for our teachers, our journalists, um, our nurses. So, in the face of that, the only category, and you can look at the UMass Donahue Institute, Institute study on housing in the phase two, that we do have in Northampton in excess is at the highest level, which is this housing. And my last point, so a question with respect to Deb, I don't understand where is the GoFundMe to get the money to give to the O'Connells to fix the building. I haven't seen it to raise private donations. Obviously 50,000 has been the groundwork. And, and so I, I, really, I really, the last one about how we will all reap these benefits of the taxes from the units and that will improve the town. And I asked the assessor about this. I said, all the time I see in this boom that I think we are all seeing in our housing. And I'm asking the committee not to be reactive, to be active. You know, how come I see a property down the street from me that sold for 600,000 and I see that six months later they'd be taxed at 400,000? How is that? And he said, no, 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 we don't just do that. We just don't take what the sale price was and assess the house for that. The only way that will be assessed at 600,000 is when we raise everyone on the blocks. And that is how properties are assessed and taxes are collected. So building high end properties in Northampton isn't going to give us a whole lot more money for whatever else we think we need, affordable housing, schools, you name it. Those are my financial points. Thank you. Thank you, Bridget. Uh, Jane, 
Oh, let me see. Janet, has Dan had a chance to speak? Is that a yes? Jan uh, Janet Gross, do you want to speak? Uh, Janet, are you there? Do you want to unmute yourself, Janet? I'm trying to. Okay, yeah. there you go. Okay, thank you. I just want to add that I think it is very important that members of the committee read the CPC guidelines about the necessity of a private purpose. And I don't think paying taxes covers that. This is state law and there are severe implications for the city. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Janet. Uh, Jane, quick comment, please. Are you muted, Jane? Um, I live on Phillips Place and we've had three houses um, in the past, within the past year, sell for over $800,000. Um, we now have, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, 23 $720,000 units from O'Donnell on the church um, property. Uh, I don't think that all of them have sold. I don't think we need 10 more units. This is a residential street in an historic district. Um, the other thing that I'd like to say really quickly is I think we're all feeling like we're being forced to make a decision that maybe we don't have to make. I think that there are other ways to explore the preservation of this historic structure since it means so much to people. And I hope that a decision doesn't happen tonight one way or another to stop the exploration of making this a public space. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Um, I, I'm reluctant to continue to call on people a second or even third time. Uh, is there anyone else who hasn't spoken? Um, Deborah, could we, could we be very quick? One quick very comment. Quick, but I just want to say the last three people that you called on had already spoken, and one of them for a very long time. So I will be. I will be brief, but this is not, you know, I'm not the only person that you called on the second time. Um, first of all, the public benefit, I think that people are saying there is no public benefit here. It's not that we have to get inside the church, but that we have the church building standing. We can see the church from all over. We can see it from downtown. The public benefit to my way of thinking is the exterior. And Secondly, I guess I keep hearing people talking about townhomes and condos and how much these would go for. I just want to reiterate, these are rental units. And when I met with Matt and I looked at the rental prices, these are not going, or at least what his plans are at this point, they are not to be high, high, high end rentals. They are medium rate rentals is what I looked at for the square footage. So Again, let's get the facts straight. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. Claudia, very quickly. Yeah, <clears throat> very quickly. I'd like to say something completely different. I'd like us to take a Howard Zinn approach to history and what's important to be preserved. On William Street, just a few blocks from this church, they've just knocked down an affordable house, which sold for $208,000. This was an important part of our neighborhood. No one, um, you know, very few people came forward to try to save this building, calling it historic preservation. Yet for us in this neighborhood, this is a missing part of history. It's like losing your front tooth in terms of the neighborhood. So I want people to think it's not just these his buildings that are big and, and whatever that are significant. Every building is significant. And I don't, not exactly sure we should be always focusing on the biggest, oldest, most whatever building. I'd like people to think more broadly about what is actually important in the city to make the city a livable, enjoyable, prosperous place. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia. Anybody else who has not spoken? Okay, again, we're getting into the second ones and I'm sort of reluctant to do this, but since we started, I guess we have to continue. Marvin, very quickly. Can you unmute yourself, please? Marvin, you need to unmute yourself. Working, oh, there we go. I have a question and not a comment. 
They're talking about this historic restriction, but that doesn't apparently uh, uh, um, apply to the interior of the building. That is correct. So that's what I'm getting from these talks. But in point of fact, the interior of that building is as unique as the exterior. And that's been my argument all along. Thank you, Marvin. Uh, Mark, very quick. Um, there you go. Okay. Um, just a reiteration again that this is apartments, but I was wondering, is there any housing here? I know there's only 10 units, but perhaps uh, some set something aside for maybe a, a wheelchair accessible uh, apartment or something like that. Because I know there's a lot of needs in town and perhaps people may, it may be an easier uh, 500,000 if something like that could be done um, to do that. I don't know, who knows, but just a thought. Thanks. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Matthew, there is no, uh, none of these units will be disability friendly. Is that correct? Sorry, uh, no, that's uh, that's incorrect. There will be an accessible unit um, at the rear of the building. So if you're looking at the south elevation on Phillips Place, it will be entirely on the on the back. But there will be an accessible, a fully accessible unit. Great, thank you for clarifying that. Okay, anyone who has had a not had a chance to speak. Okay, again, once the committee begins our deliberations, we will ask that folks. Uh, continue to be muted and uh, and we encourage you to stick around and listen. I think I will ask that we, uh, at least for my my interest, take a uh, take a little break if we can. Uh, it is uh, eight fifteen. If we can perhaps come back in a, a little less than ten minutes, we'll call it ten minutes. Eight twenty five. We will begin again. If that's okay, we encourage everyone to stick around. Um, and then we will see folks in about 10 minutes at 8.25, okay?
Sarah, are we back uh, recording? Uh, yep, yeah, we're all set. Okay, great, thank you. And I think all committee members are back here. And again, uh, to the folks who spoke and to those who are sticking around who did not speak, thank you very much for um, doing your community due diligence and making your views known. We really rely on you to, to do that, not just in this meeting, but, but certainly in all of our deliberations. So thank you. And again, we'll ask that you um, remain muted by voice, not by intellect, um, while, we, while we do our due diligence in our uh, deliberations. Uh, I thought we might want to start. Do any of the committee members have questions uh, about this project that either Sarah or Matthew can answer? That would be helpful. Uh, Linda? Um, Matthew, I would appreciate knowing um because I, I couldn't discern it from the revised uh, sketches, what difference, what changes have been made in your, in your um, project as a result of the historic consultants report? So in terms of um, changes in the fenestration and some of the architectural details, we're waiting on uh, input from Mass Historic and their reviewer to provide guidance. Um, so we fully intend to um, stick to the spirit of the design that we've shown, but rather than kind of overpromise or present something that could could change based on the input from Mass Historic, we haven't gone ahead and and made made any wholesale changes to to the design. But the intent would be to receive uh, guidance from Mass Historic use their input to guide any changes, and then um, that would ultimately be kind of the, the final design. Thank you, Matthew. Other questions for the committee, either to Sarah or to Matthew? Okay, so let's begin. And I thought not to put you on the spot, Martha, but to put you on the spot, uh, as our historic or representative to the historic commission, can you uh, talk about your deliberations and share with us your thoughts on this? Sure. Uh, the historic commission met in July, I think maybe it was early August. And um, we had a very detailed presentation um, from Mark Feller from um, Architectural Farm. And he kind of went step by step through the historic structure report. Um, commissioners asked a lot of really good questions. And I think uh, the, sh the sh in summary, we decided to take a vote on this. Um, and the vote was two pronged. And one was um, to support the application that's coming before the CP CPC. And you know that said, um, the commissioners fully understand that our recommendation is just one of the criteria criteria that are used to evaluate um, these. So um, we were going on that basis. And the second was to um, accept responsibility, essentially, for a preservation restriction, which meaning means having to service the reviewer for the city um, if that were to come to pass. Um, we did put some conditions on our recommendation to support this. And, and one was that um, the preservation consultant who is working with O'Connell did the historic structure report, remain involved through uh, the design and construction process, um, just to ensure some um, faith that preservation standards are being followed and that um, also um, O'Connell work with Mass, um, Mass Historic, which they're doing. I just want to clarify a couple of things that were said during the comment period. Um, there was a comment made that um, we approved this application. We, we did not approve anything. We voted to support um, the preservation approach if followed. Um, and also, this is not a historic landmark. Um, 
there are I don't believe Northampton has national any national historic landmarks and the state does not have a landmarks program itself. Um, the only national historic landmark I know in the vicinity is the Emily Dickinson Museum. So I just wanted to clarify that. And there are a lot of very significant historic buildings in the city, but I don't believe any of them are actually national historic landmarks. Uh, and Martha, your, your feelings on this project. I would like to listen to the deliberations of the other members before I weigh in, if that's okay, Brian. Of course. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, let's see, we'll just go down the line that I'm looking at here, Chris. Thanks, Brian. Um, okay, where to begin? I could probably talk for quite a while on my reactions to some of the really thoughtful comments that we received tonight. Um, I think for me, my decision, which is it hasn't been made yet, um, is going to focus on a couple of different things. Um, I'm, I find I, I get traction from this this discussion about whether this is an appropriate use of of public funds. Um, I don't know that the presence of a nonprofit, I actually, I do know, I do know that the presence of a nonprofit is not a decider for me on that one. Um, uh, but I, but I, but I, I, I recognize the, 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 for lack of a better phrase, slippery slope argument as to where does this leave us in the future when we're approached by other private entities looking for support. My personal view is that the precedent is non-binding, that we do have, and it is part of our function as CPC members, the right and responsibility to review each application on its own merits. And that to decide to fund a private entity in this case does not bind us to do so in the future, but I hear it. Uh, the other question is the question of if this is historic preservation, what what is the community's benefit from it? Is it a sufficient enough benefit to merit the allocation of resources in that direction? Um, and like you know, like other people here, I'm looking to hear what my what my colleagues have to say. But that's where I'm standing right now, and I'm sure my my thinking is going to evolve as we move forward. But once again, I really want to I really want to echo your 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 comments, Brian, uh, about the amount of time and energy and thought that um, you know our 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 friends in the community have put into uh, the work that they've done in um, in helping to educate us about where we need to be on this. Uh, it, it's really it's really important to me to be able to hear that kind of thing. So thank you. Jeff? You calling me, Brian? I did. I thought you were stroking Sorry, there. I thought you said Jen. Oh, no, no. Just, um, I, I'm just going in line and what I'm seeing. Okay. Um, yeah, my views are um, evolving tonight. I, I'd echo, I, I have the same feeling about, uh, I don't view this as a precedent setting um approval if it were approved tonight i think each each one of these is is viewed individually um i'm supposed to be um a housing advocate <clears throat> on this committee and i am and one of the things that gets under my um, skin is the lack of <clears throat> any affordable housing component to this but i'm also mindful that <clears throat> there are multiple variables with this committee and one of them is um, historic preservation and I appreciate all the comments um, tonight and the letters I reread all the letters again and went through the whole thing once more um, the online site before this meeting and I haven't really heard anything about <clears throat> um, well if this were not approved 
then where do we go? I think there are some interesting ideas, but I think those ideas, um, from what I can tell, um, have come and gone. And there's still a, a permit request out there for demolition that's pending. And I don't like this situation overall. Uh, somebody said it maybe in the comments, it felt like this was a little bit of a um, hostage situation. And that was part of my early reaction uh, when this first surfaced. Um, but I do think the historic component um, is very, very important. And, and once it's gone, it's gone. If, if, that's, if that's what we're looking at here. Um, and I think I'll just, again, like everybody else, I wanna hear what everybody else has to say before I make a final decision. Thanks. Thanks, Chair. Linda? Do I have to? Um, yeah, a, a number of the comments in the letter said that this was a difficult decision. <laughs> and the uh, people's remarks tonight made it even more difficult. Um, I, I brought a number of concerns to the application. Um, I, I think I voiced earlier on that the resistance to selling the property to the city for the uh, resilience hub did not sit particularly well with me, particularly when mm, one of the primary rationales was that that was not in keeping with the tenor of the residential neighborhood. And to me, that was code for, to my ears at least, um, it's going to interfere with the, the sale of the, of the newly constructed condos. Um, the second concern I have had is that at least initially it felt like the application for historic preservation funds was primarily a convenience and not a real commitment to the uh, preservation effort. I think that was indicated by the lack of a, of a consultant um, in, in designing the project. I think that has been largely remedied and that concern is, has really abated for me. Uh, the third concern I've had is again, the affordable housing concern that, that people have, have raised. Now, not all projects can do all things. That's, that's an unfair request. Uh, but I think it was the, the, the question about, is it possible to put a couple of, of affordable housing units in was dismissed a little bit too quickly out of hand. And at the same time, or around the same time, um, the applicant was decreasing their request from $830,000 to $500,000 without changing the scope of the project, which got me thinking, well, if you took that $330,000 and the debt service for that, um, which you're now not going to be paying, couldn't you, at least for the, for the life of the mortgage, lower the rents to an affordable? But again, it, that, that's not a requirement. That was just, uh, you know, where, where's, where's the scale and where's the thumb going? The biggest thing for me has been uh, the question of a, of a private entity. And I think that's what has concerned a, a lot of the commenters who op oppose the application. But I actually think that we bear some responsibility for that. And it's not, I, I, in my opinion, a private developer can certainly receive these funds. The concern is that we have not asked for enough information. It's a financial black box and putting public funds into a financial black box does not feel good. It does not feel like we're meeting our responsibilities. If it's an affordable housing project, there are caps on the developer's fees. There are, are, are caps on the developer's overhead. There's transparency about how much they're asking for. 
Um, there are operating budgets that have to be uh, presented that, to show that both that the project is feasible and also to show what kind of operating surplus might be available in support of the project or into the, um, to the owners. And we asked for that in this case, in the questions, we really didn't get much, we didn't get an operating budget and we got a pretty summary development budget, but we haven't pressed it. And in part that's because these private owners is kind of a new thing for us. And as we've seen, we've had two recently, one was Michaelman's and this is another one, and they're very different. So to come up with a template for what you gotta show us is difficult, but I think it's something that the committee really has a responsibility to tackle. Um, you can't expect the applicants to provide information that we don't ask for to meet a standard that hasn't been verbalized. Um, and in my mind, it's, it's, it's really a but for st standard. A developer takes risk, they have to have some profit, but we don't want to be inflating that profit or providing any more profit than is absolutely necessary to make the project go forward. My, so th th that, that's the biggest stumbling block for me. On the other side is the public benefit question. Um, and I, I really appreciated the letters because on top of the preservation restriction, which is the legal formal public benefit that's required, there's more of an informal benefit to the community, which is really what the, what the letters were reflecting. And that's the, the history in people's families, um, their personal histories there, the history of this city and the valley and the people who have, have, have lived and struggled here. Um, and then there's the visual, which is the joy, the pleasure that people have when they, when they see a structure like that, that contributes um, to the quality of life. So I think there really is a public benefit here that can, uh, that can justify the, the, the award of funds. So on balance with all of that, where, where do I come out? I guess I have to be, somebody has to come out. And I would say, uh, though I'm stepping off the committee, that with the committee's commitment to really look at that issue and struggle with it for future projects, to, to really try to confront what's the standard there? How do we get to, is but for the right standard that we want to apply? How do we get that information to satisfy ourselves reasonably without being burdensome, that but for, um, this money, the private developer could not go forward with a project that has a lot of public benefit. So if, if the committee were committed to that, um, then I would support, I wouldn't hold um, this applicant hostage uh, where it's a develop, developing process, it's a learning process for the committee I wouldn't hold them hostage to where we are in that process, and I would I would support the funds. Thank you, Linda. Jen, um, I really appreciate everybody tonight's comments, and especially my fellow commissioners. Um, I really echo what most of what all of you all have said. Um, so I don't have a ton to add. I guess I would, I think I've made this clear before, but for me, just like Chris said, um, the entity, the ownership entity being a nonprofit is less important to me in valuing the public benefit. Um, I also really agree with Linda that having a clearer process of valuing financially that public benefit would make me feel a lot more comfortable with these private applicants. Um, I've talked a lot about my history in conservation, but in conservation, the 
separation of public and private benefit on a privately owned piece of land is done by an appraisal. So there's a set number that you are looking at. Um, and I'm really missing kind of that layer of information in these. Um, I guess I've also, I think I agree. I just wanna echo like the letters really also affirm to me that there is a historic and public benefit um, in preserving this structure, but I do continue to kind of wrestle with the public access requirement or a, like if public access, where I land on public access being a requirement for sort of defining public benefit um, for a project like this. So, I would really defer, I don't know as much about historic preservation and historic value. And I would really defer to my other commissioners and would love to hear what folks have to say on that piece. Um, but yeah, those are my thoughts as of now. And I'm, I am still also un, undecided. Uh, just to speak to the value piece, uh, in this instance, it is a little bit easier because the applicant did obtain an appraisal, mm -hmm. uh, highest and best use of the property versus okay. use of the property with a historic preservation restriction on it. Uh, and that difference was $640,000. Okay, thank you. I Somehow I totally missed that. That's really helpful for me. So Sarah, what that means is that the without a historic preservation, if the building was to be resold, it could theoretically be well sold and resold at $640,000 more. Is that a simplistic way to look at it? Yeah, yeah that's correct. Okay. Yeah, and so for me, the investment of public funds is in that historic preservation restriction and in what that, what the implications of that will be for the future use and maintenance of the building, which are not passive. They require a lot of active, management. So that to me is a clear distinction, I guess. Thank you, Jan. Dan? My position on this application is based on answers to four questions. Uh, number one, is CPA money allowed for a privately owned property or a private entity? And my, my understanding is that that answer is yes. Uh, is, two, is there a public purpose or benefit? That answer is yes. This prevents demolition of a significant historic building that means a lot to our community. And the, the support from the Historic Preservation Commission for the application is important to me. Uh, and you know, this is not an application for, for housing money. It, it's for historic preservation. Uh, three, is public access required for a CPA project to receive CPA money? Uh, my understanding is no, you know, this is money for the exterior only, money for uh, that doesn't require public access to the interior. This is weatherproofing, preserving the exterior. Uh, so the public access interior use uh, topic is, is, is not uh, relevant for review of the application. Uh, and then, you know, does the application just overall meet the criteria for CPA funding? And it's yes. So I support the project. Thank you, Dan. Uh, once again, it will be hard to uh, have both Linda and Dan as articulate as both of them are leave the committee. And we will hope that their predecessors are as articulate and um, knowledgeable uh, as, as they were. So thank you, Dan and Linda for your comments and, and we'll hear, hear more. Uh, <laughs> One thing that I've heard now from a from a couple folks is our need as a committee, no matter what happens tonight, uh, to move forward and uh, come up with maybe enhanced set of criteria for what we would do with private applicants, particularly in this realm, and it's and it's incredibly tricky, which is sort of ascertaining the the fiscal the financial needs of of the applicant to move. The project forward and and what i'm hearing matthew say is that without the 500,000 that the project will not move forward how, how do we know that or how do i know that because matthew said that um 
and I'm not doubting his his good word or his knowledge, his intricate knowledge of the of the financials to this. And and I think when when we are dealing with the with Michelson, um, we we wrestled with this. You know, how much money is coming in? Do they really need this money? And our feeling was that it would, would be very difficult for us as a committee to uh, decide to make head or tails of the fi finances of a private business. That's very difficult to do. And that private businesses are able to, are, are not at liberty sometimes to divulge all their stuff because they're, you know, they're not a nonprofit, all that stuff. But I think it does behoove us. And it gets back to what Linda was saying, that as a committee, uh, as we move forward from, from this uh, to once again revisit that, uh, because whether we whether we grant or do not grant, uh, I'm I'm thinking the situation will come up again or something similar to this situation of a private entity asking for public money. And so, if we could have that discussion uh, without a specific project, it may it may be helpful and it may be clear in terms of how to how to set those priorities. So let's Sarah put that on our agenda. Perhaps moving forward in the fall to at least give a meeting or even more than one to um to trying to trying to trying to figure that out uh, the other thing i'd like to say is you know i i, I feel like i uh have uh, i think this is true never been so torn in a decision as as I, i've had on this on this committee um because i can I, you know when when one it's it's you know when one person says one thing i'm swayed and one person says something else i'm swayed and and it's just a very, very difficult decision. And and, uh, and I so, again, as I think Chris said, I so value hearing not just our fellow, my fellow uh, committee folks speak, uh, but uh, perhaps more so reading the letters and hearing the public when they spoke in the spring and then and then folks speaking again today. It's, it's uh, you know, we live in a wonderful town and it's wonderful that, that people are, are uh, are so articulate and passionate about all sorts of all sorts of issues, and this is this is certainly one of them. Um, so I think I'd like to. Uh, uh, I'm not sure what the end game is. I know what the end game is. The end game is we're going to take a vote, but I don't think we're there quite yet. So I'd like to go go do another round and see if people have further stuff to add. And Martha has her hand up. Thank you, Martha. Yeah, I just wanted to um, follow up with a few of my own thoughts about this after listening to everybody. Thank you so much. Um, it was, I guess, heartening for me to realize that I was struggling with a lot of the same issues that all of you were. And, um, you know, as a representative from the Historical Commission, I feel like I have a bit of responsibility to assert, you know, the preservation angle on this since it is a preservation application. Um, so just a couple of things. I think one thing that I really appreciated was that O'Connell really did take the right approach to preservation. This is not something that happened with the Michelson Gallery and um, the insistence on having the historic structure report, getting a very qualified, experienced preservation architect to look at this building and to very develop really thoughtful and I think doable recommendations. Um, they really should be lauded for that. Uh, it's really the right approach to take, and it's something that um, this commission, this, this committee, should really insist on in the future for other applications. Very insightful. Um, the other thing I want to say: um, this is I'm a landscape architect, so I deal with the exterior and public access to the exterior of buildings. And to me, Access is not just about going inside. It's about um, being part of a streetscape, um, walking by, enjoying you know, the public space that might be around the building. And so I think that's another angle that we should consider in this, that we're preserving this historic streetscape um, with a, an icon that's been there for over a hundred years. And um, you know, if it were removed, that would really alter the look of it. And um, so we would be taking away more than just a building, but I think, um, a neighborhood culture. So that would be a loss as well. Um, the other thing that I think is this is actually an opportunity to improve some of the look of this building. There are parts of it that aren't so great to look at. And I think if done right, um, and I'm hoping that that would happen, 
with um, the preservation architects working alongside O'Connell, um, there that could be a kind of a win-win situation. Um, but I also deal with the issue of housing, and I know this is not a housing application, but that, this was one of the things that really troubled me from the get-go. Um, I around everywhere in Northampton see the price price of housing rising, and it's very disconcerting. Um, so it's it's hard to see uh, another building made into something that most people won't be able to afford, at least um, who work here, a lot of people who live here. But then finally, this is kind of what Dan was doing. I went through the uh, criteria checklist that Sarah sent around again. Thank you, Sarah. That was very helpful to have this shoved in our face, which is a really thing, good thing to do on a regular basis. Um, and, you know, there's some of the criteria that this project does not meet in both the general category and in the preservation category. Um, but I think on balance, it meets more than less. So that's my uh, sense. Martha, may I ask you one follow-up question as our historic person? If, if you were to vote for this project, what conditions would you want the committee to set as, as we are uh, able to do? Yeah, so I think it's real essentially what um, the Historical Commission set down in our, um, our vote to um, support the application. Sarah probably has the actual, actual wording in front of her, I do not, but it was essentially to um, follow the recommendations of the Historic Structures Report, which are very clear, and to engage the historic preservation architect through the design and construction process and to work with mass historical. So is that is that one or am I hearing three conditions? Well, that was uh, a set, I guess I would say. But okay. yeah, maybe there are three parts to it. Three parts to that. And the other condition, well, yeah, those were the conditions. Yeah. Can you can you repeat them one more time? Sure. Sarah, do you have the language? I don't want to mistake this. Uh, uh, so the, the committee discussed uh, the applicant's willingness to continue to engage uh, the consultant who prepared the historic structures report through the process, but that wasn't a strict part of the historical commission's condition. Um, but the, the commission did require that um, the recommendations of the historic structures report be followed that a historic preservation restriction uh, developed uh, in conjunction with mass historic and held by the city in care and custody of the historic preservation be placed on the building. Great, good, thank you. Thank you, Martha. Uh, Chris? Yeah, thanks. I was just jotting some notes so I don't, don't miss what I wanted to say. Um, first, I want to thank Dan for his really helpful formulation of the issues uh, that 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 helped that. Yeah, that really set me up. Um, second, I uh, want to circle back to something that I raised initially and I now have much more comfort and clarity with. And that's this idea of accessibility. Um, the point was raised by one of the commenters about, you know, um, the quality and character of the interior of, of, of the structure. And the fact is, is that um, based on, you know, uh, the, this proposal and, and what we learned about the history of potential uses for this building, um, since the diocese put it up for sale, uh, there really hasn't been, at least in my recollection, um, a proposal that, that submitted that that had any traction where maintaining the interior of the structure as is was was a, considered a viable alternative. Um, so I'm not sure what interior access means, but historical access. Um, what I heard from the people who are supporting it, it's 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 the structure itself, and um, I think we I think we get a long way towards that. Um, with with the current proposal. And the final point I wanted to make, and this hasn't really come up in the way I, I'm going to put it out there, 
but it was this question of you know if is is ours is is the cpc money critical to uh this project moving forward and using that as a criteria for whether or not we approve it i can think of several instances in the past where cpc money has not been the pivotal component of a project and oftentimes they have been in the area of housing uh, affordable housing, where there's a recognition that the magnitude of the project, where they run into the single or double digit millions, um, is 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 such that we lack the capacity to make a meaningful financial contribution, but that our contribution was important because it showed our commitment as representatives of this community to a project that we felt was meritorious in what it brought to the community itself. Um, and that that for me is in many ways a better measure of what it is that we're trying to do here than how important the financial component is to the work that's going to be done. Um, what we're doing in, 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 as I see it, is talking about what we value as a community um and if preserving you know if 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 people are asking me do i think that preserving this building in the current usage is 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 contributing to that community i think that the input we've gotten from you know a good portion of of our neighbors says yeah it is and you know I'm I'm inter I'm I'm unlike some of my colleagues here I'm an I'm I'm an elected representative of of this commission and that means if people disagree with you know the way I look at it they can come and get me um and I I'm, I'd be happy to say that I supported um a historic component that preserved this building on behalf of the members of 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 my community I'm 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 good with that Thank you Dan uh, let's continue in listening to other people's second comments. Uh, Jeff, stuff to add from what what you've heard since your last comment? I think um, my memory serves me correctly. Um, the last time we met, um, late spring, whenever that was, um, I was basically on board with the project and I, I just was ready to vote for it. And then, and then um, we as a committee decided that we needed more input as the historical aspects. And that's why we deferred <clears throat> um, to some meeting sometime in the summer, which turns out to be now. Um, and I'm, uh, very swayed by what I've heard as far as a historical character. And I think um, I'm perfectly comfortable with supporting um, a project that only meets um, one of the main criteria instead of if you read that um, CPA guideline uh, that Sarah sent us, it um, refers to two or more. Um, but I don't think I don't think we have to have. I think we can get by with one if that's what it is. This is not a public housing component. Um, I'm trying to look at this um, <clears throat> from an overall committee perspective and not just not just from housing. I think um, preserving um, the historical character of a community is very important. I grew up in the Midwest and I can tell you, I've seen a lot of Midwestern cities where they just destroyed their downtown character for parking lots, or there was a suburban sprawl outside and that's where all the, the money went and the downtown died and was beautiful historical structures gone forever. And I am very much swayed by the argument that this building does enhance and preserves the community, um, the 
um, the history of that particular neighborhood and that particular community that grow up, grew up and used that church through the decades. And um, also, I was also um, the same thing that Jen asked for as far as the market appraisal difference, so that I I can I can feel comfortable that that um, in using uh, public dollars um, for a with a private developer we are still um, preserving um, the public character of a of a institution and a and a history and um i'm basically in support of funding this project going forward thank you jeff linda well, thankfully i don't have too much more to add but um I did take note of something that, that Matthew said, which, which resonated with me, which is that um, as a for-profit developer with you know, quite, a, quite a large footprint in the Valley, they do have the resources to maintain this resource going forward. And that's always a struggle. It's, uh, <laughs> the Catholic Church was not able to do that. Um, we'll, we'll see if uh, ODG <laughs> Can can really do that through the years, but the, you know they've got a they've got a running start at it. So in that sense, that makes them uh, a good owner of this property. Jen, um, I also don't have a lot to add. I really appreciated um, hearing from Martha. Um, just about how sort of what we had requested um, looked to you. That was really um, affirming to me of, I, that was my impression as well of the quality of that work and of that assessment and of the requirements that it was very thorough and reasonable um, and seemed done very well. And also boosted my confidence in the public benefit of the historic preservation of this building. Um, though the use will obviously change. And I also really appreciated your perspective on um, public access. Um, and I think that was really echoed in many of the letters that we received, um, that the value is not just for interior access, but sort of the historic, um, just the, the building existing as a landmark in Northampton um, and the building continuing to exist. Um, and I guess the last thing I just want to say is just to agree with what Chris said earlier, or I, I forget it was if it was Chris, actually, my apologies, but um, I also don't think that any of these decisions have to be inherently precedent setting. I think that's the entire purpose of this committee is to evaluate each proposal as it comes to us and evaluate the public benefit. Um, and in this case, for me, especially with the appraisal and especially with the historic commission's um, recommendation, I think at this point I'm in support of the project as it's been proposed. Thank you, Jan. Dan? I just be even more supportive of the, of the application hearing from my, my colleagues and uh, Martha, especially uh, like Jen said so well about uh, uh, tonight just changed my my view and definition of public access and uh, the value of, of his, historic preservation for the streetscape and the neighborhood culture and look that you you described is really well said. What I would love to happen right now is for Matthew to chime in and say, "Well, we don't really need five hundred thousand. We can do well with uh, with half of that." Um, or even two thirds of that. Uh, any comments on that fantasy? I uh, sincerely wish that was the case, um, but uh, it, it's been consistent throughout. We we do need the the full ask of of the five hundred thousand. Okay, thank you. Um, 
the other thing that I'm that I think I'm in agreement with with what most most of uh, us are saying is that this is this is I, I don't see this as precedent setting. It does not have to be that that we need to evaluate proposals on a case by case uh, basis. If we were to disapprove of this application, it would not be precedent setting. I would be uh, fine with reviewing another private entity or profit entity coming forward um, with historic preservation, just like we did with affordable housing. And we, we have done this. It's with the, with the Franklin Street project, um, which I think is moving forward. I mean, that we, we had that debate. Uh, it is a private for profit and or, right? I mean, it's, a, it's kind of a weird, weird entity. But it's not a nonprofit. Sarah, correct? Is that is that right? The Franklin Street project. Um, uh, that that's a nonprofit. It is a nonprofit. I thought there uh, was a yeah. And there's a non there's private entities involved, but the the ownership is at least part. The ownership is a nonprofit with private for profit funding that comes into it. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. So that was that was. Thank you for correcting me on that. Um, I, uh, before we move forward with voting or with final questions, I would just like to go over if in fact we're going to vote on this, that I, I personally would find it more palatable to vote on something that I knew what the conditions were. And I think Martha presented us with, um, with three different conditions. And I'm wondering if other if, if people have other conditions that uh, they would want attached to their vote, if in fact it's it, we, we are voting for approval. Does that make sense? What I'm asking. Um, so Martha said conditions, uh, and I, and I guess is do do people have uh, objections to those conditions or additions to those conditions? Brian, I just want to um, say, you know, uh, Sarah clarified by looking, I guess, at the minutes, what our conditions were on our recommendation. And I, I do believe, I guess I was mistaken about it or misunderstood, but I do believe it's very important to have the preservation consultant continue through the process to be sure that um, the recommendations of the historic structures report are implemented. I think it's important for the city for our public investment. Okay, so engaging the, the uh, historic preservation consultant through the duration of the project was one, just so, so I'm clear on this. The second one was the, the, uh, that there would be a historic preservation restriction placed on the exterior of the property, correct? And that would be held by the historic commission. Is that correct? Um, Martha, you're muted. Uh, it's it's held by the city, but pre the historical commission would be the entity, I guess, that would administer it or oversee it. Or okay, and then the third was uh, continue to follow the recommendations of the historic consultant. Is that is that correct? That's what I would recommend. Yes. <laughs> okay. Recommendations of the consultant. Uh, do people have? Uh, is there discussion around these three conditions that Martha and the Historic Commission is is suggesting? I guess one is 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 more Martha, which is engaging the the um, the consultant for the duration of the project. That was not a recommendation of the Historic Commission, but but Martha is suggesting that. So I'm hearing that there are three. Do people have discussion about that? Uh, in terms of, of um, disagreeing with those or adding more conditions to that. I think they're just right. Dan? I'm, I'm good with two out of the three on the, the historic preservation restriction uh, re requiring adherence to the historic structure report guidelines. On the, on the consultant part, I, I just wonder if, if that is necessary, you know, for for this recommendation. I, I mean, I, I would think that, you know, uh, adhering to the historic structure report guidelines, it would be beneficial to have a 
a consultant all along the way, uh, but there may be other ways for for the applicant to to achieve you know that that requirement. So I I just wouldn't want to you know if, if that's not something the historic uh, commission you know specified. I I think the other two are, are sufficient. Uh, Martha, do you want to speak to that? Oh, you have to un unmute yourself. I think without requiring the historic preservation consultant to remain involved, um, we don't have assurance that the recommendations are being followed. And I think that's what we're intending by granting this money. Um, that's not to say that O'Connor wouldn't do it anyway, but let's say there's a change in personnel in the middle of the process and whoever comes in doesn't really want to do that and no one's pressuring to do that and so it's just a it's a safeguard and, and wouldn't wouldn't the funds that, that we allocate be reimbursement for work that adheres to these conditions so I mean, if, if if they weren't adhered to we wouldn't have to to give the money is, is that right sarah yeah, I mean, the, the way it works generally in, in practice uh, for historic preservation projects that involve a lot of exterior work is that uh, a an invoice for reimbursement will be submitted along with whatever documentation is required for that project. Um, so for this one, if the, the Community Preservation Committee wanted to specifically require uh, that a qualified preservation consultant sign off on the work, we wouldn't be able to pay the invoices in, until that was obtained. So and that might be a proposed compromise that if there's if there's documentation with the invoices that that proves the historic structure report guidelines were were implemented, you know, I, I think that's that's sufficient. I you know, being a consultant myself, I just wouldn't want to force anyone to have to hire a consultant if there are times they don't they don't have to. And uh, if if the report guidelines are being being followed is and the documentation is sufficient, I'm I'm good with that. Sarah, could you rephrase, re repeat how that condition would read then that, that Dan is saying or Dan repeated? I mean, so I guess we would have to hammer that out in the details of the contract. This wouldn't be something that, and this is something that's so specific, it probably wouldn't be re re um, included in the council order. Um, but, you know, we, we could require, for instance, that all invoices shall be uh, accompanied by documentation of the specific portions of the work accomplished in the historic structures report or something like that. So the, yeah. when they submit invoices, they would say, well, you know, here's the work that we did, please reference the rel these relevant sections of the structures report. I like that. Linda? I, 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 my understanding is that a lot of these recommendations are not absolutely clear black and white do x uh, paint this red you know it's to the extent possible to the extent feasible try to replicate it's it's so that you really need somebody who's doing an evaluation process martha can correct me if i'm wrong because it's much more her bailiwick than mine but it, it's it's not a clear cut here's 10 things you have to do check them off it's not clear it's not apparent if you read the historic structures report it, it's got general recommendations it's it's the devil is in the details what does that mean to the extent feasible to the extent um so i think i think having the historic consultant say yep you got it that's right that's what i'm recommending what you did is is it meets my my recommendations i think is essential martha any follow-up to that. No, I agree with Linda. I think it's it's very nuanced and I think decisions also get made in the process. A lot of decisions get made ahead of time, but in the construction process, a lot of decisions get made. So having a preservation um, expert involved is, is critical to making sure that um, standards are kept. And Dan, would you be good with that? I, I think it's it's really good advice. I, I I think that's what 
the applicant should do is what I'd want to do if I were the applicant to, to have that expert, that consultant involved. I just feel like it, it, as a policy recommendation to the to the city council, you know, we, we should lay out the outcome we want. We want the historic structure report guidelines implemented. We want the historic preservation restriction. Uh, but how you know the, the the mechanics and the details of how the applicant achieves those those outcomes, I, I I would just be more comfortable leaving more room for for the applicant to to use their their judgment and resources and and uh, you know find that that path themselves. I, I think it's maybe just getting too much you know in, in the weeds to say you have to hire a, a consultant. Matthew, would you care to comment on this? Sure. So um, the the intent um, would be throughout the process to retain um, the preservation consultant. So it, it would not be, I think, on on our side, um, much of a stretch or a hardship. So we'd be willing to to live with that condition. Problem solved. Thank you. <laughs> I, would, I think I, would, I, would Mass Historic, my I think Mass Historic will require that too. If there's a preservation agent involved, I believe so. Okay, well, that seems to resolve that. Uh, so we have three conditions that people are comfortable with. Again, are there any additional conditions that uh, we have not voted yet? So this may be a, a, a moot, moot? Oh, it's the word of the day, a moot point uh, if in fact we don't, we don't vote approval. But I think in voting for approval, I think perhaps some of us might feel more comfortable knowing that there are these conditions that will that will help us. Um, other folks want to weigh in on the conditions or on the proposal itself before we begin to vote. We'll give the last words to Linda and Dan because they are departing folks. Anything that the two of you might want to uh, leave us with, words of wit and wisdom. Linda? No, but I, I have appreciated uh, everybody's knowledge and thoughtfulness. Uh, it's 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 been a pleasure um, spending time with with my fellow citizens of Northampton. Thank you, Dan. I, I share that view, Linda. It's been been great working with you and the committee, and uh, having such an engaged uh, public uh, on on these issues and. Uh, do help the committee uh, spread the word uh, about these resources and the important work. And we need all the help we can get to uh, uh, let the residents know that that uh, we're here. These resources are here uh, to get more applications, more awareness. So I'm, I'm glad this project has has helped with that and uh, encourage uh, people to to apply for the for the vacant position. Uh, there, there was some, some really Great leaders you know, on this this call tonight that uh, I hope would would, would apply and, and others uh, that that have been uh, visible and vocal uh, throughout the the process as I've been on the committee. Thank you, Dan. Perhaps there is a CPC in New York City that you could, or in your borough, that you could get involved in. Uh, is there any final comments from anybody else, or are we all set to vote? Yeah. Okay, so someone needs to make a motion. Can we hear a motion, please? I'll make a motion that we vote to approve the $500,000 contribution to the redevelopment of St. John's Cantius Church on Holly Street with the conditions that have been defined. Do I need to state those again? I, I think we're probably good. Are we good? Yeah, does anyone need to hear them stated again? I'm not seeing anybody shake their heads. Okay, thank you. Uh, is there a second? Second. Uh, thank you, Dan. Uh, so the motion on the floor is to approve $500,000 uh, to the uh, to Ocano for redevelopment of the St. John Cantius uh, Church. Uh, is there any further discussion? Sarah, you wanna take us through? Uh, roll call, please. Sure. Uh, Jen? Yes. Dan? Yes. Jeff? Yes. Chris? Yes. Martha? Yes. Linda? Yes. And Brian? 
Yes. All right, unanimous. Okay, well, um, thank you all the, those folks who are still hanging out in the, uh, in the, in the public galleries. We appreciate your comments and, and your time. We know some of you may be uh, uh, upset with our decision. But that's what uh, democracy is all about. We look forward to hearing your comments as we move forward with other, with other projects. Our next meeting is not until uh, the end of September. And again, for folks out there, please consult our website for when our meetings are so that you can weigh in with, uh, with your concerns or your, your issues as we move forward with a whole bunch of other projects. And uh, Brian, not to add one more thing at the end, uh, but just in the interest of moving this forward and not delaying the council vote, um, let's take a look at the council order just to make sure that I've accurately captured everything that was discussed and approved that. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Can you screen share with us? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I can read it if people want to, or you, you can just uh, read along. Sarah, this is Chris. Um, I'm sorry, I hadn't seen the original council order. Did you just? Oh, Chris, you muted yourself. Did you just? Um tweak that third whereas clause to reflect the the criteria that Martha had proposed? Is that what's going on there? Yeah, so this was, um, you know, you'd all seen this during the, the previous round, but it wasn't voted on. So it, it will conform to the Secretary of the Interior Standards. Uh, it will be in a, uh, accordance with the recommendations of the Historic Structures Report. Um, under the guidance of a qualified preservation consultant to be retained for the duration of the CPA funded portion of the work. And then uh, you can't see it, I haven't moved down far enough yet, but the approval of the historic preservation restriction is down here. Oh, okay, great, thank you. Yep, got it, thanks. Uh, so city council also will have to approve um, acquisition of the historic preservation restriction. So that's what this last piece says. Okay, Are, anything else for us, Sarah? Uh, that's it. So it, I would just need a vote to approve this to get it on the next council agenda. If everyone agrees this accurately reflect, reflects the discussion and vote tonight. Are there can any, do, any, is there- Can is I there, do one nit, last nitpicky thing? Before always, I, I, I love your nitpicking. <laughs> <laughs> Are there really any archeological uh, components to this? That's in the uh, second whereas clause. Uh, not specifically with this project. I included it just as a, a broad historical fabric, but we could certainly delete that word if people would prefer to do that. Yeah, I would actually replace it with cultural. Okay, that sounds good. Okay. And Good call. And the other, good this call is, this, yeah, and this is just a um, maybe semantics. I don't know. I think this building is actually a contributing structure to the Pomeroy Terrace National Register District. Aren't I right about that? Yes. It's not individually listed on the state and national register, I don't believe. Uh, it's it's not. I didn't intend to okay. imply that, but only to make it clear that it is included in those. Uh, but if there's a better way to phrase that. Yeah, I would, I would say it is a contributing resource to the Pomeroy Terrace National Register Historic District. Um, that's more accurate language, unless there is an individual designation that I'm not aware of. Uh, there, there is not. Okay, good. Perfect. Well, I think we, we want to get rid of that first part of that sentence then. Is that correct, Martha? If it's um, not listed, 
it's well it, it, it's it could be stated more simply it could just say the building is a contributing resource to the pomeroy terrace national register historic district that would be more accurate and then yeah correct great thank you so we place we we replaced Archaeological with cultural, we tweak the uh, the natural the National Register of Historic District. Any other tweaks uh, to these recommendations? <clears throat> okay, Sarah, you want to take us through a? Oh, so we need to make a motion to approve this. Yes. Uh, can someone make, can someone make a motion about this? So moved. Uh, Jen, thank you. A second? Second. Uh, thank you, Martha, I believe. Uh, Sarah, I'm going to take us through a vote on this. All right. Jen? Yes. Dan? Yes. Jeff? Yes. Chris? Yes. Martha? Yes. Linda? Yes. And Brian? Yes. All right, unanimous. Uh, anything else we need to do on this specific project, sir? Are we good to go? Uh, so the, the committee's hard work is done. The next step will be uh, city council discussion on September 1st. That is September 1st. So uh, mm -hmm. next Thursday, week from tomorrow. Okay, and we are welcome to weigh in on that. Okay. Um, as always, we conclude our meetings with any other business not foreseen when the agenda was published. Do folks have any other uh, business that we need to deal with? If not, we'll see I would just most. like to, before, we, before you say goodnight, Brian, I would just like to get clarification. So are we not seeing Linda and or Dan again? Is that what, is oh dear. Uh, well, we hope to see them again. Yeah, but I know, not, I know. Not in the context <laughs> of, of this. As, uh, um, uh, and we'll have to visit Dan, I think has opened his uh, new, beautiful, historic, huge house to in New York City to us to stay at whenever we want. <laughs> Is that what I heard? Yes. Well, uh, we're, we're still going to be Northampton homeowners and paying the, the CPA. Uh, uh, dollars, so we'll we'll be paying attention. Maybe I'll show up in the the public comment section uh, in the future. Sure, but, Brian, thank, thank you for your services, Chair and Sarah, for your your staff work. I, did, I neglected to say that. Of you, you all have been amazing and uh, made serving on the com committee uh, really enjoyable and easy. Well, thank you, Dan and Linda. We will see you around town, I'm sure. So you're not you're gone, but not not forgotten. Um, so any other any other business not foreseen or are we good to go? Uh, Sarah, correct me if I'm wrong. I believe our next meeting is September the uh, 28th when we will be looking at um, uh, at uh, small grants and expedited applications uh, uh, among is, other things. Yes. Is that correct. correct? That's correct. Okay, so, so, so we have a month and month and a half here. Uh, well, this was a, a, a fascinating meeting. I always feel so privileged to be among such uh, interesting and articulate committee members as well as an articulate and committed public, uh, not all who got what they wanted tonight, uh, but hopefully we did our due diligence and we'll move this, move this project forward in a way that, uh, that contributes um, to the city and to all of us. So thanks everybody. Uh, and it's, what is it, 9.34? Uh, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Oh, so, so there was a lot of so moved there. And a second? Second. Second, okay, great. Uh, thank you so much, everybody. We'll see you, or most of you in a month and a half.